He was educated by the fathers of the oratory with a view to the priesthood uh, in 1825. The oratory, by the way, at the time of modernism, became very modernist. And I don't know why. That's the oratory of St. Philip Neri. But they, uh, they became uh, of at least a modernist tendency. Also the Sulpicians. France. Not France. But the Sulpicians did. So he... Uh, he was educated by the fathers of the oratory with a view to the priesthood and ordained in 1825. At first he led a very retired life, but gradually took more and more interest in the affairs of his country and the new political ideas as well as in the literature of the day. So this was when the Carbonari were very active in Italy, uh, pushing for the elimination of the Papal States and the unification of Italy under Savoy, Turin, which is exactly what happened. The royal family of Turin became the kings of Italy, Victor Emmanuel II. So if you go to Rome, you'll see the, the big street in Rome is the uh, uh, Corso Vittorio Emanuele II, wh who was who is the king at the time of the takeover of Rome by the um, disgusting Garibaldiists, etc., the Garibaldi animals. And uh, it used to be the Via Papale, the Papal Street. And now, in, uh, so it's Vittorio Emanuele. So that whole thing was a big slap in the face to the Pope. And that's why Pius IX and Leo XIII had nothing to do with the Italian state. And would not uh, uh, give the blessing from the balcony. They gave the, the initial papal blessing from inside. There's a balcony inside. There's a big portico in St. Peter's Basilica. And there's a balcony inside underneath what you call the, you know, the, the covered area. So you never see the pope from the, just as a, a, sl a slap back to the Italian state. It would not bless the Italian state, in other words. And that was, that was a problem. I think Pius XI was the, f I think he did it. I think so, but I, I can't remember. So, so he's a, a typical liberal leftist of the 19th century in Italy, right? Gioberti. Partly under the influence of the Freemason Mazzini, uh, the freedom of Italy became his ruling motive in life, as if Italy were not free. <clears throat> its emancipation not only from foreign masters. Now, you have to understand that Austria, uh, as a result of the Treaty of uh, Vienna uh, in 1815, uh, got a good chunk of northern Italy. Venetia and other parts of the Adriatic part of Italy, a big chunk of Italy. So Austria is in control there. Uh, and uh, so they want the Austrians out. But from modes of thought alien to its genius and determined to its European authority. This authority was in his mind connected with papal supremacy. This must be remembered in considering nearly all his writings and also in estimating his position, both in relation to the ruling clerical party, the Jesuits, and also to the politics of the court of Piedmont, that's Savoy, that's the house of Savoy, is the, uh, is the uh, ruling, ruling house. Piedmont is the territory. It exists to this day. Piedmont is extreme northwestern Italy that borders on France. Uh, home of Turin and also Verua, Savoy, is in Piedmont. So. And Father... Ricosa is Piedmontese, and he'll never let you forget it. Uh, <laughs> uh, occasionally he speaks Piedmont, and I always tell him, if you speak Italian, why would you ever speak that Piedmontese? It, it's, I mean, Italian is so elegant when it is spoken well, and it's spoken well in the north of Italy, beautifully. And it, you know, it sounds like Latin practically, and and uh, 
uh, it's a cross between Italian and French. Terrible. Whenever you get a cross like that, some, like in Alsace, they speak a cross between French and German. Just think about that. <laughs> I heard it once. Uh, I couldn't believe it. So the um, <clears throat> so Charles Albert is one of the kings of Savoy. Right? Gioberti was now noticed by the king and made one of his chaplains. His popularity and private influence, however, were reasons enough for the court party to mark him for exile. He was not one of them and could not be depended on. Knowing this, he resigned his office in 1833, but was suddenly at arrested on a charge of conspiracy and after an imprisonment of four months was banished without trial. Gioberti first went to Paris and a year later to Brussels where he remained until 1845 teaching philosophy and assisting a friend in the work of a private school. He nevertheless found time to write many works of philosophical importance with special reference to his country and position. All right, so uh, Piedmont is the, is the hotbed <laughs> God bless you, of this Italian liberalism. You're going to see Mazzini uh, and uh, Cavour. Cavour is the, is the mover, you might say, uh, of the Italian so-called unification. Everything is so-called. Uh, Cavour. He was a, a prime minister of the king in, uh, at the time of... Uh, well, he died prematurely, but he was, uh, I don't think he saw the actual reunification, but he was a, a, a prime mover in it, Cavour. There's a Piazza Cavour in, uh, in Rome. Um, so. An amnesty having been declared by Charles Albert in 1846, Gioberti, who was again in Paris, was at liberty to return to Italy, but refused to do so until the end of 1847. On his entrance into Turin on April 29, 1848, he was received with the greatest enthusiasm. Don't forget that's a year of general revolution in Italy. Uh, excuse me, Europe. Paris, Berlin... Naples, Rome, England was not affected, and Madrid, I don't know, I don't think, there, I don't think so, no. Uh, Vienna. He refused the dignity of senator offered him by Charles Albert, preferring to represent his native town in the Chamber of Deputies, of which he was soon elected president. At the close of the same year, the, a new ministry was formed headed by Gioberti, but the, with the accession of Victor Emmanuel in March 1849, uh, his active life came to an end. Uh, I think that's Victor Emmanuel I. For a short time, indeed, he held a seat in the cabinet, though without a portfolio. That means he was basically powerless. But an irreconcilable disagreement soon followed, followed and his removal from Turin was accomplished by his appointment on a mission to Paris, whence he never returned. There, refusing the pension which had been offered him and all ecclesiastical preferment, he lived frugally and spent his days and nights as at Brussels in literary labor. He died suddenly of apoplexy, which means a stroke. That's a, a, an old medical word that is not used anymore. On the 26th of October, 1852. So that's, uh, that's from Wikipedia. Okay. In philosophy, he followed the doctrines of Malbranche and developed them. That's, he's the big ontologist. He set up a distinction between being, ends, and existences, existentiae. Only God is ends. Creatures are existentiae. Man, from the beginning, has an in immediate intuition of ends, which is exercised in the form of a judgment. Being, inasmuch as it is being, exists. <laughs> Which is just kind of an absurd thing to say. It's, it's like saying two plus two equals four. You know, like a big breakthrough. It is 
also immediately known that ends creates exi existentiae. You see, you don't have to conclude from the existence of creatures to the existence of God. You don't have to do any of the logic. You just know that per se. Therefore, man is created with an innate idea of God creating the world and intuits everything through God. So that, that's a common teaching throughout all the ontology, is that we have an immediate intuition of God and, and we see everything through God. Then there is Antonio Rosmiti, Rosmini Serbati. You see his dates there. He's pretty much uh, a contemporary of, uh, of Gioberti. The Italian philosopher was born at Rovoreto in the Italian Tyrol. That's uh, extreme northern Italy near the Austrian border. The Tyrol in Austria is the, well, the big city is Innsbruck, which means the Inn. There's a river Inn that runs through it. And Bruck is a bridge, so it's the Inn, inn Bridge, right? But the river Inn. And someone was explaining to me that the river Inn, this is uh, uh, when I visited Passau, where the Inn and the Danube come together, that really the Danube should be called the Inn because the Inn is much bigger than the Danube. If you see the Danube, it's kind of you know, small, and then the Inn is big. And so <laughs> all this water is coming in from the mountains, so the Danube should be, it should be the Blue Inn and not the Blue Danube. And by the way, the Danube is not blue in any respect whatsoever. That's, that's romanticism. All right. So that's the inn. Uh, oh, yes. How do we? Oh, the, oh yes. The Tyrol is, uh, it, Austria it looks sort of fat like this. And then it, there's a, something sticking out over here. And uh, if you put a mouth on that and eyes, it, it looks. Uh, so the, this is the Tyrol. All right, and the big city is Innsbruck. There's Vorarlberg as well, which is by the Swiss border. And, uh, and then this is uh, Vienna down here. So there's a part of Italy in North that, that is here, and that was very disputed. See, it used to be that up to World War I, the Tyrol extended down like this, and it was Austria and German speaking. And then, because of Italy's great accomplishments in World War I, and I say that, you know, it ha just happened, to, they switched sides, you know. They were supposed to be on the German side. Uh, and so when they saw who was winning, they switched over to the other side. And they got a chunk of Tyrol. And to this day, uh, the, the Tyrolians in this part of Italy are upset that they're attached to Italy. So anyway, that's, that's the Tyrol. That's where he's from. I think it's uh, Bozen, Bot Bolsano. I think, uh, I think that's the city there anyway. So, so uh, he belonged to a noble and wealthy family, but at an early age decided to enter the priesthood. Uh, after studying at Pavia and Padua, he took orders in 1821. Pavia is so south of Milan, famous for a big Carthusian monastery and magnificent. Also, somebody famous is buried there. Very famous. Nobody knows. Saint Augustine. It's buried in the in uh, somewhere in Pavia. All right. In 1828, he founded a new religious order, the Institute of the Brethren of Charity, known in Italy generally as the Rosminians. The members might be priests or laymen who devoted themselves to preaching, the education of youth, and works of charity, material, moral, and intellectual. They have branches in Italy, England, Ireland, France, and America. His works, The Five Wounds of the Holy Church and the Constitution of Social Justice, aroused great opposition, especially among the Jesuits. The, the five wounds of the Holy Church are what's wrong with the Catholic Church, essentially. 
and, uh, and in 1849 they were placed upon the index. Rosmini at once declared his submission and retired to Streza on Lago Maggiore, all right, um, where he died. So there, there's a big house there of Rosminians. I saw it when I was in Streza. Lago Maggiore is a magnificent place. You should go see it one day if Italy ever opens up again. Before his death, he had the satisfaction of learning that his works in question were dismissed, that is, proclaimed free from censure by the congregation of the Index. <clears throat> Twenty years later, the, the word dismissed dimitantur became the subject of controversy, some maintaining that it amounted to a direct approval, others that it was purely negative and did not imply that the books were free from error. The controversy continued until 1887, when Leo XIII finally condemned 40 of his propositions and forbade their being taught. All right, so those are in the Denzinger, the condemned propositions of Rosmini. And then Ratzinger uh, took it away, because we understand better now. That's what the modernists always say about any, anything they change. We, un we understand it better now. So in 1848, Rosmini took part in the struggle which had for its object emancipation from Austria, but he was not an imitator of the movement which ended in the freedom and unity of Italy. Uh, excuse me, an in initiator of the movement which ended in the freedom and unity of Italy. In fact, while eager for the deliverance of Italy from Austria, his aim was to bring about a confederation of the states of the country which was to be under the control of the Pope. See, that's what Pius IX was foreseeing. It was, uh, he was patriotic. He uh, was actually happy that the Austrians were driven out by the French and the Italians in 1859. Uh, the Austrians were protecting Italy uh, from the Garibaldi creatures, and also, uh, you know, they were favorable to the papacy, but Austria was not always... Uh, uh, a good boy with regard to Catholicism, and uh, Franz Josef was, uh, and all the, the, the you know, Joseph the Second and all. Uh, there were ideas in Austria that were uh, contrary to to Catholic uh, practice, and in certain cases, Catholic doctrine. So, I mean, the the Austrian monarchy was never a real friend of the Catholic Church. Uh, the uh, Austria was profoundly Catholic, but uh, even Franz Josef, who lasted until World War I, uh, did things that were uh, offensive to Catholic practice, such as certain rules concerning divorce in Hungary. Right. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so he was he was uh, patriotic. Um, but he was naively foreseeing that, well, you know, we'll make a confederation of all of these various states in Italy. There are many little dukedoms and whatnot. And the Pope will preside over this confederation, that, that this is what these people want, you know. I mean, he, he was dealing with the devil himself. I mean, all of Mazzini and Garibaldi and all these horrible people. So, I mean, it never happened. But that was, you know, suggested... Uh, that, uh, and that's uh, the Italian priests were telling me that Italy still has, still looks to the Pope as sort of the king of Italy, the ruler in Italy, because uh, the Italian government is so unstable and has been so unstable that no one could ever have confidence in it. You know, it's, it's they, it just it just crashed again, the Italian government, uh, and uh, so. Um, uh, you know, they don't take it seriously. And they told me that when the government falls apart and there's no government in Rome, that things work better in Italy. That, you know, they're, they're, it's like nothing. You wouldn't even know that the government fell apart. That the only way you know it is that things operate better when the government is not around. So they told me. <laughs> so... And he's, they said that's why it's a little difficult to make progress in Italy because the Pope is so much part of Italian life. You see that if you say, well, he's not the Pope, it's like saying somebody's not the president. 
And so there's a, uh, and he said most of the pious people that are left in Italy, the few, you know, dozen or so that are left in Italy are, uh, you know, they're, they have that natural attachment to the Pope so that you have a hard time convincing someone of, of our position. So they were explaining that to me. So anyway, uh, so Rossmini had a reputation for piety. The source of his error is his ignorance of Aristotelian philosophy. He said that all ideas are required except the idea of ideal being. So again, we've got this problem. Being for him is very close to Kant's category of being. See, that's a, an innate category. We don't learn it from existing things. We, we have it and we apply being to things. He therefore says that the notion of ideal being is inborn in us and that it is the form and light of reason and that the soul which is in the beginning which in the beginning is only sensitive is brought to a higher state of being that means only animal is brought to a higher state of being its nature changed made intelligent subsistent and immortal Rosmini sees the cognitive process in this way a sensitive perception is received, and this excites our idea of ideal being. So it's like uh, a motion detector. You see, it, oh, look, there, there's, there's, there's a something. You see, so it must exist. So we, it's, it, the alarm goes off. You see, and we become persuaded of the real existence of the object. So we add being to our sense perception, something like a cake. You know, you, you have some, some flour and sugar and all, and then you add something else, and you put it in the oven, and you, you've got knowledge. So you, you add being to the sense perception. We form universals by divorcing the idea of existence from our persuasion of the real existence of the object. So you take existence out of it, and you have a universal. For him, universal being is the same thing as divine being. So this being that we have, this notion of being, is the divine being. See, that's ontologism. This divine being is limited in creatures. I mean, how could you have a divine being limited? He furthermore teaches that God is the intellectual light of the soul as if we had the beatific vision. It's all nonsense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But this is what he taught. Critique of ontologism. First of all, one must establish the principle that there are two ways to see all things in God. The first is objectively, that is, as the object known, in the same way that we would see objects reflected in a mirror. The second way is causally, that is, as a principle of cognition, just as we would say that we see something in the sun because it is seen through the causality of the sun. For example, we might ask someone to step out into the sun in order that we might see him better. This means that we will see him through the causality of the sun, that is, by means of the sun's rays, light, which is a necessary condition for vision. Hence, we would say that we see the person in the sun. This does not mean that the sun is the object of our vision, but rather the cause. Applying this principle, therefore, we can say that the soul knows all things causally in God, that is, in the eternal ideas. For example, gold is true gold because the created essence matches the divine idea of gold. Since our cognition is of things, and since we, things are caused by the eternal ideas of God, we just talked about this in De Deo Uno, then our cognition is immediately caused by God. Since our ideas must be conformed to the, to the divine ideas. We do not, however, see the divine ideas objectively. So we do not see what God sees in himself. This is reserved to the blessed in heaven. Ontologism is false, therefore, primarily because of the testimony of human consciousness, 
which has no evidence of a direct intuition of God. Who has that experience? I see God. <laughs> Secondly, the ontologists make the distinction between the ideas of God relative to creatures and the essence of God himself. But this distinction is wrong, since in God there is no distinction. And to intuit the, the divine ideas is to intuit the divine essence. In this system, even the damned in hell would have a vision of God which would pertain only to the blessed. Was they would retain knowledge of things. In addition, ontologism confuses being with being, capital B with small b. Being with a large b refers to God as subsistent being, who is the perfection of being or limitless being. The other being with a small b refers to our mind's abstraction of being from singular existing objects. So those two things are radically opposed in the sense that they are most distant one from the other. This is an abstraction of our mind which is totally undetermined. Everything is a being. Whereas this is a real thing, obviously, and maximally determined. The divine being. There's only one God. See, this applies to everything, even imaginary beings, a gold mountain. There's a gold asteroid out there, by the way. But, you know, fiction, fairy godmothers, <laughs> they're fictional beings. You know, or, or mythological creatures. Pegasus, a horse with wings. In the sense that it's, it's a mythological being. I mean, we conceive of it as a being. That term comes up, being with small b. So those two things are maximally opposed. And to put them together is the summit of stupidity. These two concepts are opposed. God is all perfect being, whereas our abstraction of being is completely indeterminate and potential. See, this is total act. This is total potency. It can apply to anything. Total indetermination. Total perfection, total imperfection. God is not common to any creature or to anything else, whereas being, as we abstract it, is common to everything which exists or can exist. This confusion of the two beings leads to a confusion of the natural and supernatural orders, which is the problem of modernism. So ontologism is a pre-modernism. For if our minds are capable of knowing the divine being, it means that our intellects, although created, can know an infinite object. And then you've got problems. This leads to one of, the, uh, one of two conclusions. Either God is finite, God becomes the world, or our minds are infinite, the world becomes God. In other words, either God becomes naturalized or the world becomes supernaturalized. 
either God is one of the guys or we are gods. The Novus Ordo is God is one of the guys. The, what is known as transcendental Thomism, the Cardinal Mercier. Incorporates these ideas. Trent, there's a C in there. Mercier, he tried to, uh, what would you say, reconcile St. Thomas to Immanuel Kant, Cardinal Mercier, just so you know. His works are in the library. Uh, he, he, you just have to know that about him. Uh, others are Steenbergen, not Father Steenbergen, but uh, and uh, that's a that's a van, and Van Riet, uh, Maréchal, he's the big one, and Lonergan, Canadian. Those are the transcendental Thomists, and uh, again are in the flow of modernism. Louvain, which next to Holland, it, Louvain is in Belgium. It has been traditionally a hotbed of false ideas. As soon as you see that word Louvain, the red flags go up. Yes. Maréchal. Yes. I think he's Belgian. They're all Belgians. Belgian uh, or, or Holland. Lonergan is Canadian. Mercier was uh, Belgian. These are Belgians. Marichal, I think he was Belgian, but I don't know if he was. Joseph Marichal, he was the big, even more than Mercier, the big figure, that movement. So if you see those names associated with Thomism, notice, uh, remember they're transcendental Thomists. And not really Thomists. Yes. They're they they follow Fichte. No, that's a whole other world. Professor Laut, Fichte, and uh, Father Schmidtberger was uh, part of that. I remember the day he arrived and he announced to everybody that he was a saint of a cantist. I remember it. <laughs> but then he had a conversion. Professor Laut was a thoroughgoing state of a cantus in Munich. Professor Laut. Yes, which means loud in German. Well, in this life, we can't know God in himself. You can go know God in himself by means of the uh, lumen gloriae, the light of glory, which elevates the human intellect to know him. But apart from that, we can only know him through creatures and revelation. But there's just no direct vision of God. Whereas ontologism is saying that we have this direct vision of God, which is ridiculous. Just amazing how people could take this seriously. It, it defies common sense. All of those other German uh, idealists, I mean, it has nothing to do with reality. How could they ever become popular and be taken seriously? You know, 
know, zeitgeist and the, you know, the, the absolute and the ego and the. But it's all from that 18th century uh, thinking, which really is all from the Reformation. Renaissance and Reformation are ultimately the source of all of our problems. The, the French Revolution was merely a political and social application of, of the thinking of the 18th century, but the thinking of the 18th century really came from the Protestant Reformation. But that would be a whole other lecture. But the, the uh, so it, it goes back to the Reformation, the, the um, I mean that was truly a revolt. Uh, and uh, uh, but uh, we'll get into that right now. But that's why the 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 principal movers of the 18th century thinking f found their ideas in Protestant countries, England, Holland. Holland was avidly Protestant against the Spanish. Uh, they hated the, the Catholic monarchy of, of Spain. And then Northern Germany, Leibniz and all of that, that, that whole area was loaded with those ideas. Uh, and if they filtered into Southern Europe or Catholic Europe, it was from those places. So phenomenology, this is important because uh, JP2 was a phenomenologist, uh, Ratzinger was a phenomenologist. It's important to understand this. Phenomenology in general, Kant's philosophy as we have seen has two major errors in it. One, agnosticism by which the mind is incapable of knowing essences knowing rather only its own experiences or phenomena, and two, idealism, by which the mind, through categories, manufactures reality. So you have an experience and you give reality to it. You categorize it. You say it's causality, it's this, it's that, it's this, according to his categories. That's Kant in a nutshell. We have already seen how Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel took the idealism of Kant to its logical conclusions that the world is mind or idea and the individual existing things are mere moments or manifestations of the idea. That's those three in one sentence. The agnosticism of Kant will be developed by the phenomenologists and existentialists in reaction to the grand universalist system of idealism formulated by Hegel. So they are anti-Hegel in that sense. The, the, uh, everything is idea, everything is fate, everything is, is uh, uh, you know, whatever the zeitgeist is, is interested in today. Phenomenology will accentuate the personal experience as well as subjectivist notions of truth. It detests objectivism or essentialism. That's key to it. The idea of ob objectivity is, is like a, 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 a... How would you say? A, an insult to the mind. See, the object imposing itself on you, just like as if you were a camera with film in it. There used to be something called film, you know, back in the dark ages. You know, so it, it is, oh, yeah, uh, uh, it's just terrible. See, so, and it hates essences. Essences are defined objective principles uh, by which a thing is what it is, and essences never change, and everybody knows the same essence, which is, of course, true, but they call that essentialism. 
That is the enemy for the phenomenologist. Which sees the mind as a faculty made to know essences and definitions, <laughs> which is precisely what Thomism is and scholastic philosophy in general. The object of the mind is, is an essence. Cat, dog, bird. That's why we can speak to each other all over the world. Everybody knows what a cat is, what a dog is, and a, what a bird is. Because we all have images in our minds, known as concepts, of a single essence, which is always the same, and has been the same from day one, and always will be the same. See, the, the modern philosophy hates that mentality. Truth has to be uh, absorbed and massaged by the mind. You see, otherwise it isn't really true for you. See, it's got to go through a process. The object has to be, you know, somehow made re relevant to you. See, it's my experience. That's phenomenology. Just to give you a, a general idea of it, I mean, you could read books on the whole thing, but that, that's the basic idea. So objectivism or essentialism, the same thing, is detested by the phenomenologists. So that's why you read Ratzinger, and there's never anything that is concluded. You just read all this stuff. I should bring in a book by Ratzinger. You read a paragraph and, well, what is it at the end? You know, what are we supposed to think? But he, he's, he's a typical phenomenology. He just gives you stuff to think about. So you just to digest and you come to your conclusions, which is contrary to the unity of faith of the Catholic Church. And that's why they, they don't enforce unity of faith. We have a a so-called president who is claiming to be a Catholic and he's promoting abortion. He should be excommunicated. He should be kicked out of the Catholic Church. They will never do that because they have adopted this idea of, of well, you know, that's his experience. And, you know, nobody, people are in birth control. Uh, what's what's that? Uh, Bergoglio's, uh, he, he recently excoriated birth control. Well, no, no. Low birth rate in Italy. Italy has a deplorable birth rate. And never did the term birth control come up that you're all popping these immoral pills. It's just, oh, the worldliness of the Italians who want to uh, you know, have villas and uh, vacations instead of children. Well, how do they do that except by popping that filthy pill? Because they get a free pass from the Novus Ordo priests to pop that pill. And they have been getting that free pass ever since the 1960s. And that's why Italy and Spain have the worst uh, uh, record for reproduction. the two most, in principle, Catholic countries, reproduce the least of all of the countries in Europe. It's, and if that's true, it's because of the Novus Ordo. It used to be, you know, back in the Dark Ages when I was growing up, pre-Vatican II, Catholics would very commonly have six children. Commonly. Many had more. I mean, you wouldn't even think about it. Well, that's nice, you know, they have six kids, seven kids, eight kids. Now, you're the shame uh, of the supermarket if you walk through with all those kids. You know, are those all yours? And by the way, I heard uh, a perfect response to that if ever you wanted to suggest this. The response to that, if it's, if it's a woman, you know, and usually they get it, uh, the response is, yes, I married a real man. <laughs> Just remember, that's a perfect response to that. <laughs> uh, the, uh, 
but it's it's shameful it's rare and it's shameful now to have to be par parading around with many kids you're destroying the environment because they're going to eat a lot they're, they're you know more fuel to carry them around and you know they're going to populate the earth and And all it goes to the Novus Ordo. In those Catholic, once Catholic countries, you know, the, the I mean, is the Novus Ordo has destroyed Catholicism in those countries, and he's complaining now, you know, that Italy is going to not reproduce itself. Well, who's who's to blame for that? How do, how do you afford to buy villas and go on vacations? So anyway, I don't know how we got on that. Uh, so, rather, nothing is real for them uh, unless it is personally experienced. These are key notions in phenomenology. The subject and object each go through a transformation in an experience with the result that the knowing subject and the thing known are transformed in the act of knowledge. So you become something different, and the object becomes something different. See, so it's like a you know interaction. This doctrine obviously leads uh, to subjectivism, since everyone's experience is different. So this is the handmaid of modernism. Just as scholastic philosophy is the handmaid of theology, that's what they used to say. Ancilla theologiae. This is the handmaid of modernism. The very purpose of abstraction and definition is precisely to universalize concrete objects so that words have universal and determined meanings. But phenomenology considers the universal abstracted essence to be a dead thing which is devoid of meaning. It is not lived. It is a thing. See, it's not, it has no reality for you unless you live it. A big proponent of that was Maurice Blondel, French. Modernist. that something is not real unless you live it. Turn of the century, uh, you know, time of Pius X at that time. Oh, he's blown down. You'll see that in another course, all of these horrible people. Lived around the same time as Bergson. Oh, he Bergson. So, what happens to Catholic dogma in this? A dogma is above even objectivity. It is a revealed, unchanging truth from an unchanging God, which demands our unchanging assent even to the point of accepting death rather than to deny it. That's a dogma. Well, I, when I was in the modernist seminary, they called, uh, the, well, one professor who was extremely liberal said, a dogma is like a stone from heaven on your mind. Like, you know, something falling right down and, you know, it's, it's terrible. It's, a, it's an insult to the mind. It's offensive to the mind that we have dogmas. Uh, there was a famous French writer who was a personal friend of Paul VI, and it was not Maritain, Maritain was also, but uh, forget his name. Uh, but he told Archbishop Lefebvre, and Archbishop Lefebvre told us, that Paul VI cannot conceive of a fixed truth. This is somebody who knew Paul VI intimately. Cannot conceive of a fixed truth. 
Could you imagine the Pope of Rome not being able to conceive of a fixed truth? I mean, this is why we are where we are. So the key to understanding phenomenology and existentialism is this, and that's the end of the class. Tomorrow is Lincoln's birthday, by the way, if anybody's interested. Jean... Jean Guiton, yes, Jean Guiton. Yes, that was uh, a personal friend of Paul VI. And he said that personally to Archbishop Lefebvre, that he cannot think of a fixed truth. He cannot conceive of a fixed truth. I mean, that's very damning. I mean, especially that it comes from somebody who knows the mind of Paul VI. That's terrible. I hope nobody ever says that about me. <laughs> I can't conceive of a changing truth. <laughs> so, 